Hello, hello and welcome to the Uplift Your Game panel, eight ways to get better at RPGs. I'm going to start off today with an acknowledgement of country. So in the spirit of reconciliation, ArcanaCon acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to their elders, past, present, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. Um, so hopefully you can you can hear us and see us, um, <laughs> and we'll get cracking. So um, the topic of this panel um, is about ways you can uplift your games of RPGs, whether you're just starting out role playing or you've been doing it a while and you're looking for ways to get the most out of your sessions. Um, and we're going to be talking about three main areas today. The first one will be getting on the same page and creating good play culture at your table. The second one is creating interesting stories and how you can help bring your games to life. And then briefly, we'll be talking about wrapping up your sessions. And after that, we'll have a spot of time for questions. Um, but let's kick off by introducing ourselves and uh, saying who we are. Uh, so I'm just going to go uh, according to the order I can see in my screen. So Patty, do you want to kick us off with the introductions? Happy to jump in, Haley. Um... Patty Hutchinson here. I'm a Melbourne-based theatre maker and game designer. For a long time, I was the main producer and host at the Liberation Industries Actual Play podcast. So I have been sort of chewing around on games for quite a long time now. And uh, yeah, I suppose though I come from a very... Mm, I, I suppose both Lee and I come from quite a performative background. We're always interested in uh, sort of helping people come out of their shells. So I think that's me. <laughs> Um, actually, since since you've already been semi introduced, Lee, do you want to do you want to go next? <laughs> Sounds good. Well, uh, the end of Patty's kind of belies my thing because the first thing I was going to say is um, I'm the introverted half of liberating of uh, liberation industries. Um, I've been sort of kicking around writing on Patty's coattails in the game design scene for a little while, but um, long time player myself, um, I do a lot of event management um, with narrative spins on things i'm a writer by trade um and i'm here because i just really like collaborative storytelling and the different dynamics that you get when you get a lot of people creating a story together as opposed to one person creating and sharing a story with others so that's me yes that's an ethos i think me and i can identify with uh v, do you want to go next Yes. Uh, hello, everyone. I am V. Hendro. Uh, I'm a game designer with Story Brewers. Um, I do sort of a little bit of graphic design, and my stints in role playing games sort of started from not the performative side. I'm much more uh, into the. I actually came in from board gaming, but I loved. Um, I likely love the collaborative storytelling element of uh, role playing games. And I personally am not very good at the performative elements, in my opinion. Um, so a lot of my strategies for gameplay will reflect that. <laughs> Don't understand yourself, but yes. Um, and I'm Haley. I'm the other star, uh, half of Story Brewers role playing. So V and I create games together. Um, and yeah, we are really interested in creating games that are collaborative, emotional, and imaginative. And I think that really describes the way we run and play games as well. Um, so the things that we're going to say are all about that. Uh, so let's jump in, let's get into it. So we are starting off with getting on the same page and encouraging good play culture. Um, so the very first thing you want to do when you are playing with a group of people um, is to make sure that those things are established at the table before you get rolling. But they're also important to think about throughout play. Uh, Lee, do you want to kick us off with this one? Yeah, sure, I can go. Um, so one of the things that I find is most uh, not not necessarily overlooked or under-discussed, but um, something that I find there's a lot of very interesting conversations about, but only in very niche areas, um, is how we talk about agency in games. Uh, there's a lot of agency around consent topics, which is extremely important but I'm currently talking about storytelling agency, which is how much the players and the game master each get a role in creating what's going on. So last, uh, 
I think it was, yeah, well, it, it was only 2019, even though that seems like a decade ago now. But um, around the sort of December holiday time period, um, I ran a quick one-shot game for some friends that I hadn't played with before but have known for absolute years. Um, and I was playtesting a, a game that I'd come up with, a homebrew, whatever you want to call it. It was based around tokens and one of the mechanics was it's very sort of blades hacky um and i think patty can fill me in on where exactly i got this idea from because i'm blanking on the name of the of the exact game but you get uh there was like a, a world intrusion token where you can play a token and have and say this is now true about the world do you remember that that yeah i, I remember played? that one it, it was a bit a bit like fate a bit like uh a, mm. a bit, of cortex to it as well like your numenera kind of yeah yeah so yeah little narrative yeah. control tokens yeah yeah um so i was playtesting a system that had those and one of the things that i wanted to check was whether or not i was giving out enough tokens that the characters or the players felt comfortable using them didn't feel like they were going to run out but also felt like they were worth earning when i got because the way that you earn them is that you let me do something nasty to your character. Um, and you've got to, if they're, if they're just as common as water, players will look for the, just look for the next opportunity. Um, but I, I just wanted to check I had the balance right. But the problem was, as I played the game, the characters never actually played one of the tokens. Despite all my best efforts, I kept throwing them, and the way that I had gone about it, was to say, all right, I'm going to create a weird world. I'm going to create a weird setup where there's a lot of normal touchstones, but it's clear that anything can and probably will happen. The goal with that was so that the players would sit down and go, oh, I'm not going to break something if I use this token. It's not going to be a problem if I suddenly say hedgehogs can talk. I have a rope with 10,000 angry bees in it. Um, but unfortunately for me, that backfired because what it actually did was created a world where the players felt more invested in hearing what I was going to throw at them <laughs> than in making changes themselves because they were enjoying the sp experience of being told a story at the table that they got to explore. They were just, they wanted to pick apart. Yes, okay. <laughs> Um, and that's also very true, true, Blake, that um, some players think that if they, they try anything. Um, I, I like to think that this wouldn't have been the case in this session, um, simply because I've known both of the players for more than a decade and they know I'm not that type of asshole. But um, are we allowed to say asshole in these streams? I forgot to check. How, how high is our rating? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I will attempt to avoid it from now on, but uh, that was something I PG now. A PG now. Starting now. Um, but yes, no, that's also absolutely a thing, and that is uh, and that is part of discussing agency. Um, and the idea that at the beginning of the game, you either... And my problem was that I attempted to signal, thinking that the players would get the message. What you actually need to do is sit down, if I had said at the beginning of the game, I would like to test out this mechanic, um, I think I would have gotten a lot better engagement with that. But that is a, that is something that you need to consider with your party going in is, is this a group of people who would like to be told a story that they can participate in? Do they want to explore a world? Do they want to have strange, um, I, I can answer that in a sec, Adam. Um, do they want to have strange experiences and new things thrown at them that they can react to and at the end they go, oh, totally wasn't expecting that, but that was so fun? Or are they the kind of players like we tend to be at Liberation Industries where the players are totally happy and actually kind of eager to go, yeah, okay, but I want the villain to do this next. You know, do we want to say this is a faction that my character knows well and therefore I would like to have agency in how they're portrayed in the game. Um, Patty and I are fans of session zero for this, uh, for this thing where you sit down and you do the world building together and that's a good way to gauge interest in world building. Um, are the players sort of sitting back and letting other people do things? Are they actively taking uh, an involvement? 
Do you want to encourage one or the other? Because it's also totally legitimate for a GM to sit down and go, I would like to tell you a story that you that I would like you to be involved in. That's totally fine if that's what everyone's going in expecting and wanting and that's what everybody's interested in playing. So um, that's my first takeaway from the from the session is sit down with your players, have a session zero, talk to everybody and make sure that you know how much they would like to create the story as well as how much you would like to tell a story to them. Great. Um, awesome. So I'm going to move on to my tip for this section, which is ask lots of questions. So a role-playing game is a conversation and just like any conversation, you can engage other people, sorry, and build on discussions by asking questions. And in my view, uh, asking questions is again an underrated technique to uplift your game. People love to be asked questions in general, in life. It makes them feel consulted and valued. And in a role-playing game, it just gives you so much good stuff to work with. And it's not just uh, GMs or DMs who can ask questions. Players can do it too to find out more about each other's characters um, and ask permission for stuff happening during the game. The question is actually a very versatile tool in RPGs. So I'm going to go over what I think are four great uses for questions in your game. I'm sure there's a lot more, but these are the ones I have personally found the most useful. So firstly, uh, and very topically, it's very good for getting on the same page. So when you're playing a game, a lot of ideas exist in the heads of the players and the person running the game, but they don't actually become part of the story until they are said out loud at the table. Um, so questions like um, can help you to clarify and to bring things that are ideas that people are thinking about into the story. So for example, are you the older sister or the younger one? What's your relationship with the ship's crew like? Have you been to this castle before? These questions all help flesh out details that are not just independently interesting, but help everyone get on the same page. Um, and you can use them to clarify contradictory or vague information and also to check in before you make a decision. So for example, I don't think the captain likes you very much. Does that sound right to you? Um, or I think he wants to kiss you. Will you let him? Um, and that way uh, it helps you get the consent um, of the player or contribution from the player involved before you go ahead with doing something and makes the story told in a more collaborative way. Uh, another great use of questions is to paint the scene. So questions can help you bring the world to life and allow players to contribute to the look and feel of what is happening. So when you are running a game, um, you don't have to do everything by yourself. You don't have to describe every single thing by yourself and make every decision by yourself. You can throw that out to the players and that will help involve them more in the game. And it will also add great details that you might not have thought of. So you can ask questions like, what does the throne room look like? What does the appearance of the army camp tell you about the wall? And these can create really unique sensory details and can even reveal realities about the state of things. Um, and you can kind of direct these questions. So if you listen to the last one, what does the appearance of the army camp tell you about the wall? It does let you know that there is a war going on I mean, there's an army camp. Um, you can make it even more directed and ask, what does the appearance of the army camp tell you about how endless the war has been raging? Uh, another great use of questions is to drive the story. Um, maybe that is perhaps maybe the most useful function of questions when you are running a game. Uh, drive the story forward by prompting a character or a group of characters to act. The classic question used in this case is the simple but effective, what do you do? Uh, what do you do? What do you do next? Is a great story driving question, but it's not the only story driving question. You can also ask more directed questions like, you're running short on supplies, what are you going to do? Or questions specific to a situation like, do you let him get away with that? To kind of prompt characters to act and get, get, uh, get into the mix of things, get into, involved in the situation. And the last use of um, questions that I think is very worthwhile is to edit play. And this is mostly for if you're running the game. It's a very gentle way to edit the flow of play. And I'll talk a bit more about editing the flow of play later, but um, like there's a lot of ways you can use questions to do this. Uh, for example, you can use it to move the spotlight from one character to another. So if you want to... Um, if one person has been taking up a lot of space in the conversation and you want to give someone else a chance to talk, you can say, um, what is Elizabeth up to? 
you know, to try to move the spotlight to the other player. Um, you can move from one scene to the next. Should we end the scene there and pick up at breakfast the next morning? Um, you can move from one event to the next. You grab it and you return to the inn, but now you have it, what are you going to do? Um, so questions are a really useful way to do that smoothly. So in conclusion, if you don't know, ask. If you want to know more, ask. And if you think you know, but you want permission, ask. There's never a time a question is out of place, in my opinion. <laughs> um, all right, Patty, um, you want to jump in next? Awesome stuff. Uh... Yeah, look, I, I suppose I'm following on a little bit from what V was talking about with, I suppose, in a funny way, our culture coming a little bit from board games and also what Lee was saying about uh, the culture of engaging with the mechanics of play. Uh, I've called my segment Zoom In, Zoom Out, which is, of course, fantastically vague and helps no one. <laughs> but what we do have is a really unusual... Uh, culture that is formed within role-playing games because really we're not playing board games where sort of every potential move is accounted for and we're not doing improv theater where you know anything can happen and let's just hope everyone stays on the stage uh we are sitting in this uh in this in-between space that i think is really both sort of under-analyzed and very intriguing as well because we have these mechanics that both facilitate play, but also do something that I think is very important as well in that they draw focus and sort of tell you what play is supposed to be about. Now, I do see a lot of chatter flying around uh, in RPG communities around the idea of immersion and, you know, how much we should be, I suppose, met almost method acting our, our characters as players. But I found that probably the healthiest thing to play uh, in, in my own experience has been the capacity to step into those characters and then out again as necessary and one of those moments of stepping out is when you engage in the engage with uh, the mechanical elements of the game um as i said those mechanical elements are often there if they're you know if they're well designed you know i think a lot of them are just put in there for laughs <laughs> I mean, a well-designed mechanic is there to tell you what the game's about uh and you know as a great example, um, any time we're playing, say, uh, don't rest your head, if you take, you know, you, you step back from the game to count out your dice and that is a moment for the tension of the game to be ratcheted up. It's like, okay, how close to uh, my own end, ga own end game? Use your, use your syllables. My own end game, are we? Uh, a game like, you know, like world's, world's greatest role-playing game, Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay 2nd Edition. <laughs> um, so you know you, you, are, you are rolling um, to decide it's like, am I going to die of infection before the session is out uh, it tells you what's important uh, through that game uh, and you know you, like I think immersion in character is very important for a lot of people but we also consider that you know your, ca your character is not lying on their bunk rolling dice to decide whether they've got the flu it's we're always going to be negotiating with the game at a certain distance so I think some of the best advice I can give to people is, you know, like you, you don't, you don't have to be like Lee and I, you don't necessarily have to be putting on a show for the camera and fun fact, I edit to all get out. I, 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 there is a lot of fudging that I do to make us sound a lot sort of quicker off the mark with our comebacks than we actually are. Um, How do you stop ruining my mystique? <laughs> Like, I thought I thought this was a pull back the curtain episode. I thought that's what we were supposed to be doing. Like, uh, liberation industries behind the alcoholism. Oh, it's too, too early in the day for that. Um, We've moved to an M, M rating now. <laughs> sorry. Um, adult themes. Um, yeah. So, but, uh, you know, like I don't think. And there is, I suppose, particularly when you look at the success of uh, the more performative elements, critical roles bring immediately to mind. People think, like, oh, I have to be putting on a show for my friends. But I, I don't think you do. Uh, in the manner that you wouldn't necessarily be doing all the voices when you play Betrayal on the House and Haunted Hill, which I certainly do. Um, that's just me. Don't, uh, don't judge me. Um, I think it is a healthy thing to recognize, I suppose, the artificiality of the game. You can step in and you can step out and 
you know, Arcanacon's open table policy is a, is a greater extension of that. It's like, you can engage with the game as much as you want to. So for people who are new to the culture of it, uh, I would say savor those moments of engagement with the mechanism, because these artifices have been built, built to uh, help you enjoy the collaborative storytelling play. It is something that you can actually sink your teeth into and it becomes part of the experience. So, um, yeah, with that in with that in mind, uh, we have a uh, sorry, my doorbell rang and it threw me off completely. <laughs> it's like yeah, we, we, with that in mind, we have this really rich and interesting thing that, as I say, doesn't exist in in other shared storytelling forms. It is a, a moment where we can, in the manner that you would have, I suppose, slow motion or a crash cut or you know, elusive things in in TV filming. You have these moments that absolutely help you focus on what the game is about and what's important. And often it can take people a bit of, a bit of encouraging to discover that, as, as Lee discussed. It's like, please, use your fate points. They will come back. <laughs> but yeah, like, it, it is absolutely part of establishing your, uh, your, your table culture. But once it's there, I think it can be a really rewarding thing. So, TLDR... Feel free to step in and step out of character and in and out of mechanics as you need them, because that's what they're for. I'll uh, pass the fire on, I guess. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Patty. Uh, v, over to you. Yeah, these are all really, really um, great and interesting um, tools that we can use. I think it is definitely the case that role-playing can be quite a unique medium to to get into, but... Um, at the same time, I actually think it's also quite an easy and natural thing for people to get through because like all of us probably at some point in our lives as children played some sort of pretend game and it's, it's a lot of it is an extension of that, um, that kind of play. Uh, and I think it's always great to bring it back to, um, that that's what this is. It's play and it's a way to enjoy ourselves with each other amongst other things. Um, but my point about, um, in this topic of um, getting on the same page, encouraging buy-in and good table culture, uh, is as a player, I think one of the most helpful um, thing you can, things you can do is to be a fan and support other players' stories. So I don't think it's just the GM's job to do this. Um, it's way more interesting sometimes in story in these uh, role-playing games if. The major, if the the players themselves have really strong relationships to each other, um, you know, it's not just about a party and the external world, which you know often it is. But it, a lot of what people find interesting is that inter party, intra party dynamic. So to have a really rich and good version of that, it's really up to the players who are playing all these characters to actually also support each other's stories. Um, and what I mean by that is that it's really useful to assess if you're coming to sit down and play a role-playing game, um, and it's it's really good to assess how your um, perspective in that game um, interacts with all of the other people who play on on that table as characters. I mean, so you know, am I? Do I like you? Do I hate you? Why has something happened in our past? Uh, that would cause our relationship to be X, Y, or Z. Um, did did I cheat you in a game of dice? And, you know, it, it sort of starts, like, during character creation, I find is often the best time to do this as players, is when someone else is starting to flesh out their characters. You can try to find hooks into them as it would relate to you. Like, you don't have to artificially make these, although sometimes I definitely do just be like, I kind of want to be rivals with you so why don't we throw some stuff in there but sometimes if someone is like explaining their character and you've got an idea for yours it's great to be like have that radar up to be like where can i where can we intersect our stories where can there, there be something to t hook us in together and uh that's a great thing to ask questions about uh to understand that you have the agency to do that um in a, you know you have to decide together obviously consent is still uh, a thing, so you'd be, would you like X, Y, Z? But it's a good opportunity to to set that up in um, in in that character creation stage. And doing this uh, throughout the game really helps strengthen that kind of tension. So that if that 
player now wants to do something, you have already you already have inbuilt stakes as a character, so it's easier to react in interesting ways and not just be like, yeah, okay, fine, we'll go find your chicken, and then we'll, you know, after that, can we do my hedgehogs? It'd be much much more interesting if there's like, you know, if you have thoughts about how they would, uh, they what what you think your character might think about what other players are doing, and that is story um, tension and seeds. So. That bonds is always really important. There are some systems and games that will force you to make bonds. Um, I think that it's always great to spend more time with that uh, as you go on. And the other thing is to, the other way you can support outside of that is just in in the session itself um, to really help the GM in spotlighting other characters. That's about pulling people into your scene if that would be interesting um, or ending your scene and saying, hey, let's leave, like, there's a cliffhanger. I'm interested in what, you know, the other half, we split the party and I'm interested in what the other um, half are doing at this stage. Can we see a bit of that before we come back and see how this went for us? Um, as It's funny because I think a lot of players feel like that's always the GM's job to do that. And I'm sure the GM is probably thinking about that, but if this is a GM game, I mean, a GM-less game, it's everyone's responsibility. But I think that that can be very helpful because the GM's probably thinking about 50 million other things. And so if you do see that, there's nothing stopping you as a player from just suggesting that because I think that's another thing that helps your table culture um, be that everyone there steps up, um, that it's not just one person's job that everyone's watching out for each other. So like those are the kinds of um, things that I usually look at for in trying to run my games. And that is where we come back to the idea that I am a lazy GM in the sense of I will divest myself of response. I will share that responsibility as much as I can um, because that is part of collaborative storytelling is that you do want to have buy-in from everyone and everyone feels like they're responsible in some ways, then they will. So um, start doing it. So yeah, that's that's be a fan, support each other's uh, other players' stories, but support other players, um, support the people you're coming there to play with. Looks like it's up to us for a bit, Patty. Fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah we. Assuming I, I've just disconnected myself from the Twitch stream, but hopefully that will keep us firing. Uh, I'm not reading anything from Haley or V at the moment through the Discord, but hopefully we're still running. Um, <laughs> now, nah, look, that's that's just the wonder of the internet age, isn't it? I'm oh, gonna yes. do it. I'm gonna bounce us a quick little test, and we'll see what comes of it. Hopefully, that is still holding together. Yeah, yeah, we're still on. We're still on. Ah, excellent. Yeah. So, yes, no, v, V's absolutely right. Um, Patty and I are also very much uh, divest the GM of responsibility type GMs. A um, little bit, yeah. I mean, it is it is something that I've, that I've sort of... It, it's a tension you have to explore with your own uh, play group, I think. It is just absolutely one of those things. That it works um, differently for different people. And, I mean, you were talking about it before. Some people absolutely want to be told a story or, or to participate, I guess, in, in, a, in a story. Mm. Um, and it, it gets really interesting because the uh, and here's where we start to get into the uh, the the nerd in me. Hello, we have a Haley again. Welcome back. Welcome back to the party. My apologies, but thank you for going forth. No, look, <laughs> that's, that's that's all good. Um, I I think we've, we've lost V as well. So yes. are we exploring alternatives on that? Ah, yes. oh, good. Yeah. yeah. We can we can uh, keep talking about what we were talking about for another couple of minutes if you want us to give yeah. you a sec to uh, sort mm -hmm. things out. Um, that, yeah, please do. Yeah, mm. jump in whenever you're ready. Patty and I will just continue shooting the shit. All right, I mean yeah. PG. Um, <laughs> yeah, look, about that, um, we cannot be trusted to keep things PG. <laughs> It was always going to be us that dragged this stream down to the depths. A little bit, a little bit. Um, um, yeah. So, yeah, I was um, saying something about uh, um, divesting GMs of responsibility. Yeah, and we were um, talking about levels of uh, 
Uh, you know, people like whether oh, people want to be that one and yeah, I guess responsible for because... their own collaboration. Yeah. Oops. Um. Yeah, because the it is very interesting because the the gaming itself is an inherently interactive medium. Mm. A game is always going to be, unless it's a, a lyric game, which I just learned the actual definition of like three days ago. <laughs> this is how experienced I am. Still a um, little um, wishy-washy for me, I'm going to admit. <laughs> yeah. Um, thank you very much, Logan, for explaining to my to my uh, inexperienced um, personage. But yeah, um, as a as a game player, you are going to be sitting down and you are going to be interacting with... <laughs> yeah, well, fair enough. Um, you're going to be interacting with other people in order to create this story as just part of how this works as a medium. Um, so when you're creating stories, people do really want to be sit, to sit down and be told stories, but they also have an expectation of being able to participate. Um, and it's, it is often not an explicitly understood or stated thing that they want out of the game, but it's something that they will still go in expecting. Um, and that's a very interesting space, uh, as I, my background is in genre theory, strap in folks, um, as a something to, <laughs> thanks, thanks, Stevie, um, uh, so as, as a genre theorist, like, something that is very interesting to explore is the setup of expectations at the beginning of a story or at the beginning of an experience and how people are both implicitly and explicitly aware of what is going to take place. Finding for a lot of players, and this is sort of advanced level GM stuff, but thinking about your players and thinking about what uh, what experience they want out of this story, thinking about what they might be expecting going in that they don't know that they're expecting, and then tailoring what you do to either explicitly at the beginning say that's not how, and yeah, Blake is absolutely right, you've got to do this sort of player group by player group because they won't all be the same. Um, explicitly at the beginning going, here is what you can expect from this game, or here is what you might be expecting that you're not going to get. Mm -hmm. Versus sitting down at the table and then demonstrating a set of expectations through your opening, through your session zero, through your intro, um, the musical, because I, I don't think I can pick him up at the moment, but I can. <laughs> I heard of actual cats very definitely. There's one on my arm right now, uh, Catelyn Clock. But yes, um, that was that was very much an example of you know moviegoers went in not necessarily expecting the musical cats. The musical cats people went in and weren't really. I'm not really sure. There's sort of divided opinions on whether they got what they were expecting at all. I think from what I've read. Um, but yeah, it's it's why the part of why the movie was so uh, so discussed and so uh, while widely disliked. Um, obviously there are other factors as well, but yeah, definitely expectations, setting expectations and then meeting, subverting or failing to meet those expectations. Cause there is difference. There is a very big difference between subverting someone's expectation and failing to meet someone's expectation. Um, and I've talked for long enough, Patty, would you like to take the mic off? Yeah, I was, I was just going to say we, yeah, we, um, are in a really privileged position, I think in this scenario having all of these like these, like the theories we can bring to bear um best advice i can say is if you if you recognize these things then you're not going to trip over them i mean you know you, you don't you, you don't have to like be throwing genre theory into absolutely every game you have mm. but as as we've discussed uh up up thread as it were um yeah like having those expectations in play and getting an idea of what everyone expects out of your play session means you're yeah. not going to trip over it and, you know, cause trouble down the line. So. Yeah, we've got a couple of questions in chat. So, yes, uh, Stevie, any suggestions for extricating hidden expectations from players? Um, Kevlin Clock, it is absolutely a session zero technique. Um, sitting mm. down, discussing concept, aim, tone and subject matter. Excellent, excellent point. Um, I would also say that there is the session zero technique of the uh, pilot episode or the opening mini-sode, which we do a lot, which is where you can... Um, yes, and they may change over time. That's absolutely right, Logan. Um, 
where you can do a mini sode, which brings out all of the expectations, or not all of them, but you can pick up expectations that you may not have been thought to ask about or that you may not have come across in the discussion, sitting down and doing a low stakes, character driven mini sode. Mm -hmm. Here's where you are, here's where you start for the main plot at the beginning can be really useful for drawing out techniques that. Um, mm -hmm. um, give everybody that producer privilege so that we can edit it in post. Like, yeah. you know, it's like, you didn't like that bit? Okay, we can change that bit. Yeah, we're, we're all receiving notes. So it looks like yeah. we've got Haley back now. <laughs> yeah, both Haley and V back. Oh, we do not have sound. For are, you, are you on? Are you on press to press to speak, Haley? Or Haley just said uh, that we'll oh. probably we'll we'll go. Oh, she's going to work out how uh, why it's not got sound. <laughs> but um, we'll take questions at the end and we'll keep powering through the next section. Yeah. Yeah. Let's jump. Let's jump back on uh, and get get back on track. I guess. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> no, no, you're not on. Do you want to hop on my my beautiful uh, webcam? <laughs> <laughs> We're in the same room, so we can do this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I won't be able to hear anything, but that's fine. Hello. So, <laughs> yes. We were talking about creating interesting stories um, and what you can do during the game to help make stories more interesting and more engaging for the players. So, Lee, did you want to kick us off with that one? No, we, we were up to that. Oh, you already did that. Yeah. That's already so done? Yes. Oh, so we're it's talking me. about settings and plot. Yeah. Do we want to skip? Yeah, yeah railroad. Yes. railroad plan. Addy, do you want to talk about three things while I fix my technical difficulties? That's all right. Look, I would love, you know, I would love to say that I'd actually... I absolutely look. I absolutely enjoy when I see Lee or see Sid Icarus or or anyone go into these fantastic deep dives, <laughs> uh, picking apart like the the true potential of our genre. What I've bought is it to the party is an improv game, um, <laughs> but it, it's it's a bit more than that. It's sort of brain training as well, uh, and I think something you are going to have to accept. Uh, in this field is that at some point, no matter how well you've thought things out, no matter how much you've planned, you're going to have to make, you're going to have to make things up. You're going to have to do something on the fly. Now, three things is sort of a bit decided in this one. Like the first half of it is that active brain training that I mentioned. Three things is a, is an improv game. Basically you are fed a pitch uh, and you have to think of three things that relate to that pitch. You know, it's like if, if you're, you can do it with an offsider or with an oracle, um, depending on how you want to do it. If someone will just say three things we found in the bank vault, or three things that uh, you get from this shop, or three things that the wizard doesn't want to see. Um, and you, you, you're, you just as quickly as you can, without properly thinking about it, you just sort of jot those things down. Now this is great. Now we talked. We talked about setting before. This is how you generate setting in a hurry. If you don't want to be, you know, if we go back to rituals, a lot of your old school games will have big tables or what have you for this. So you can sort of, um, what's the word? You can sort of uh, put the responsibility on on the book, on the treasure table, or what have you. But to have this little trick in your head, and to, you know, it's like it's a here's something you can take home. It's a fun thing you can play with your friends. Uh, that's actually a really, that's actually a really vital thing. And then maybe, maybe the fellow put, put me onto this, just walked into the room. Uh, <laughs> it's like, the house is full of improvised theater people. What am I going to do? Um, so yeah, like you, you just take that and I'm not going to force you to play it on stream. We don't have to do that unless I actually get a, unless I'm actually getting active volunteers on this. But all you need to, like I say, it's a two-part thing. All you need is to be fed that prompt and just immediately think of, okay, three things that would happen here. You know, it's like three, it's like three, three things that the Norse Raiders do at their summer festival: wrestling, feasting, running around with big flags. It's easy as can be. The other side of this is, and once again relevant to our games, is on the receiving side because it's to do with concise description. Uh, because in my experience, and I have absolutely no scientific backing for this, so your mileage may vary, um, human brain struggles past three descriptors, I think. 
So just simply feed, like, to, to give people a picture, get the three most important things, and that'll get their brain cooking. Uh, you know, like the, the you know, the, the old uh, Victorian London horror, you know, it's, it's foggy, uh, the bricks are black, and you can't really hear things very well over the sound of machinery. And it's like, and that's your setting. Like, the rest is all in your mind. Um, so to have these two factors, the capacity to just rattle off, um, rattle off little setting fragments and have them received in that way, that's gonna, that's absolutely gonna help you at a sort of scene building level, in my experience, once again. Um, I suppose running the old saying that less is more is gonna help you a great deal in that regard. Don't strip it back too far, but, uh, if you sort of... Let those fragments set, let everybody stew that in their heads, and then we come back to our previous topic again. Let them ask questions. Really, that's all you're going to need. Is there any chance I can be heard? <laughs> yes. yes. How exciting. That's so great. <laughs> um, awesome. Thanks for that, Patty. Uh, so I'm going to uh, about what I, uh, a way that I think stories, and that is to keep in mind and why do we so and this is sorry i'm holding just... uh, you're cutting in and out a little bit with yeah. your, your volume i have I no idea why that's yeah. happening <laughs> i think maybe the distance is a bit easier it's closer is it's better yeah i think it's voice sensitive so you might need to be close to your microphone yeah, Discord's noise cancellation can get a bit aggressive sometimes. What if I speak with more volume and more enthusiastically? All right, that's effective. Cool. Okay, so I was talking about thinking, why do we care? This is this has been an incredible uh, technical difficulty run I have been on, um, much like many online games <laughs> in this post-physical era that we live in. Uh, so thinking about why you can care uh, helps out in two different ways. Firstly, it really helps you with skipping the boring bits and zooming in the juicy narrative moments. So we don't usually need to see Thalen the Dwarf brush his teeth, the party walk between the inn and the market, or one that I find people um, bring up a lot, the, the thing where you, you have to question the five people who don't know anything before you find the witness that I uh, you, you You can skip over that, you can go directly to the good stuff. Uh, you're at the market store, you found the right witness, and then it's just, what do you do now? What do you do now you're in this And this also means that you don't need to make players roll for every little activity they do if you're in kind of dice. Um, so you don't need to ask for a roll unless you care about what happens if they fail. You can just let them do it and move on to the good stuff, yeah. So failing to find the building is usually pretty boring, but failing to sneak through the security system in the room with a giant gem is interesting. Uh, the other great benefit of thinking, why do we care, is that you can create really meaningful situations and decisions for the characters that the players will be able to engage with. Uh, so you can try to add a reason to care for the players for the most important events and circumstances in your game. And the best way to do this is usually to uh, involve or link the characters directly to what's happening. So for example, if, if you're in a fantasy setting and two great lords are fighting, um, Thalen, our aforementioned dwarf, might not care about this. But if one of these dwarf lords is Thalen's adoptive father who rescued and raised him, Thalen suddenly cares about the situation a lot. Um, the other ways to give players a reason to care is to put the beliefs people or things the characters care about at risk. Um, and that also <laughs> prompts a reason for action. Um, and another thing that can help is to make the flow on effects of what is happening clear. So if two lords are fighting, that might not be interesting, but if their fight is gonna destroy the home of one of the player characters, then it's interesting. And another aspect of uh, that is to make sure that the player's choices have so when a character decides to do something during the game, it actually has the ability to change the state of things. Um, if you have a cool thing that you want to bring into your game, but you aren't sure why the characters might care and you're wrecking your brain and you can't think of anything, you can just cheat and ask them. 
Uh, so again, the power of questions, you can just be like, who do you know here? Or what enticing reward have you been offered if this feudal lord wins? Um, and you can uh, uncover a lot of juicy reasons to care from that. And then you can take those answers and use them um, to make the story more engaging. Just as they, you can bring those things back in later, later on in the narrative. Uh, so that's thinking, why do we care? And creating interesting stories. We're going to move on to our last segment now, which is wrapping up your session. So over to you for that. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so for wrapping up the session, there is this technique that I do. Um, I thought Luke Wade from Australia also made this up. It's called Stars and Wishes. Um, and I love it for many, 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 many reasons. Uh, and the way Stars and Wishes works, at the end of your session, um, you go around all your players and you do a round of stars, which, and a star is one uh, star, gold star, that you give to a player. Um, another player at the table, the GM or anyone, uh, about a cool moment, something you loved, about what they did as players or as interesting fiction in, uh, as characters in the fiction of the game. Um, it's just one really cool thing. I think we all very naturally do this anyway, like, oh yeah, I really enjoyed when you X, Y, Z. Um, that often happens at the end of the session and it's nice to just um, have a moment to be able to share in those kinds of things. Um, and then the wishes part of Stars and Wishes is a wish that you have for the next session. Um, and I like to make this as broad as possible from wishes in the fiction and wishes as players. Um, so, you know, it, well, hey, what am I wish for next session? Could we just take a bit more breaks in the middle of the game? Uh, can we not sort of go into, you know, um, you know, we're playing a parrot game. I don't want a mutiny. Is that okay? Uh, it's a way to like future self-correct your sessions as well. So um, the way Stars and Wishes go, goes again, just to summarize, you go around everyone and do stars, and then you go around and do wishes um, for that session at the end of every session. So this is something I do in all of my sessions, unless I forget or run out of time. Um, but I really like it because it has the, um, the part where you celebrate what was cool about the game and about what other people brought to the table. Um, and that's also like really good data for understanding what people do find cool um, as players and as GMs. Um, so you can see what really speaks to other people at your table and understand their needs and wants better. Um, and then there's a section with the wishes. That's a much more uh, overt, like express section to let people tell you what would be cool to go ahead with. Um, and it's having that ex like explicit section where you're asking them, hey, we just had this session. What would you want more or, or amend? What would you do differently if you had the chance to? Because we do have the chance to next week when you come back and do this again. Um, and so I find, especially if you're new to GMing, wishes can be a really, really helpful tool to uh gauge because sometimes you really don't know unless you get that feedback and um, doing this lets you get that sort of feedback. Um, so I don't know if there's any other questions about Stars and Wishes. It's pretty straightforward, but I think that if you do it, you'll find like all the reasons why I, like, I find it's really helpful. I think it's, uh, it's, a, it's a nice little um, ritual as well, which is the other thing I like about it at the end of the session. Um, so yeah, that's that's sort of just my little end of wrapping up session thing that I do. I know there's a lot of um, debrief stuff if you are out there on the internet if you're looking for more information about like um, end of session procedures. Um, debrief is very can be very helpful, especially when you've had intense sessions. Um, but there's a lot of uh, stuff out there about that that I won't sort of go into in this particular one, but I'll just point you towards it. <laughs> Um, thank you, V. We had the joy of hearing you in V's microphone for a second there. Uh, awesome. So that wraps up uh, the main section today. So we are going to open the floor up for questions. If you have a question, can you please type it in the chat and to see what questions we have to answer. But while we're giving people a minute to type their questions, uh, I'm just going to start off with a question of my own for everybody. Um, so when you're starting off in role-playing, whether you're uh, 
playing in a game or you are taking on the role of a facilitator or GM, there's a lot of advice uh, that you can read and there's a lot of advice we get today and a lot of different tips you'll hear uh, that are all really great, but it can get a bit overwhelming. Um, so I'd love to hear from everybody, um, what do you think is the best way or as a player? How, how do you go about improving? I'll jump in. Uh, the two biggest things for me, I think, if I look back, was just to listen more and to just do it because it's practice hours and don't feel like you need to be the best. Um, just I think that you will. it's a skill that you will naturally get better at by doing and it's meant to be fun. So if you're enjoying yourself um, and playing, uh, eventually you'll just pick up nifty tricks along the way that work for you. Um, so that's helpful. And then listening is a big one for me, just listening a lot. <laughs> yeah, um, listen, build in systems so that you can get feedback early and often. Um, and then just do what makes your group seem to have fun and tell you that they had fun and ask when the next session is going to be. Um, that's honestly going to be your, your biggest uh, your biggest pointer is like, is your group actively having fun? If so, you're probably doing something right. And then ask them for feedback anyway, because there's there's always things that you, you might improve that... Um, you know, they can be having fun but still think, oh, I really wish that one thing had, had gone a different way or, man, I would really like to see a little bit more of this in the story. So never never stop asking for feedback just because you think you've got it covered. But if the group's having fun, you're probably improving without even realising it and you're on the right track. So, Yeah, look, I, I don't know that I could cover it much better than that. Don't, don't get hung up on being perfect. Just find what works for, for you and your crew. And uh, yeah, really, if it's making you happy, then that's great. If not, maybe try and figure out why and then work from there. Uh, I guess the other biggie is um, to coin an apocalypse worldism, just always ask, what do you do? Because really, that's what, it, that's what it boils down to in the end, isn't it? Just we, we take one step and then we take the next one. Uh, one thing that I that I will add, for if there's oh. somewhere that you know that you... Oh, sorry, did I interrupt you? Okay. Um, right, that was a go on. Uh, no worries. <laughs> um, is that if you have somewhere that you are specifically looking to improve, like you know that when you get thrown into a, into a session, you don't always have the greatest scene descriptions if they're just off the top of your head or... You introduce NPCs and you haven't really got the hang of indicating which ones are important or giving a sense of their personality quickly and off the bat so that the players have an idea of how to interact with them. Um, actively like, look into how to improve on that. Um, Blake has said um, actual play, watching and listening to actual play helps a lot. Yeah, look for examples. Look for... You know, it's something that you can try next session. If it's NPCs you have trouble with, contrive a reason with the player's agreement for them to go into a social setting. Throw yourself into a into a place and then try something different for every NPC in the room. And watch what the players latch on to. Like, do experiments. The players are going to be fine with it. They, they're experimenting too. They're learning how to interact with other players and how to... Um, how to play in a scene and give this give the spotlight to other people and take it at the right times so there's things that they're experimenting with as well so there's no reason why the gm can't go okay i'm gonna work on something just bear with me for a session let's see how this goes chances are you'll just have fun with the process of it yeah, I wanted to add to that. Um, don't be afraid to stop and think as well, or to change your mind. Um, <laughs> if you just if you say something, then you immediately realize that it's not where you want to go. Just be like, "Hey, that's not where I want to go. Uh, actually, can we do it this way?" Um, because people people won't mind at all. 
um, and taking a moment to think can really help you think about the things that you've learned um, and the things that you are trying and put those in place rather than um, sort of feeling that pressure to come up with something instantly on the spot, which can be um, okay, cool. Well, it doesn't look like we have got any questions, so um, unless anyone else has, does anyone have any parting words they would like to add um, before we wrap up today? No pressure. You can stop and think. <laughs> I'll allow it. <laughs> That's right. I talked for like 10 minutes in the middle about, about genre theory. I think everybody's been <laughs> to me, so I like everyone this, else uh, take this one away. This comment, uh, if you get really stumped, a bathroom break can because my, my backup uh, tip actually was tactical breaks in this exact same way. I will often be like, and think about what you're going to do while I go to the toilet. <laughs> and I'm thinking about what might happen next. Week. So yeah, it's a good tip. That's a good one. The cliffhanger is absolutely your friend. Yes. Yeah. Like you don't know what's going to happen. Neither does anyone else. Just double yeah. down on that. <laughs> and that's like... good. <laughs> <laughs> I think there has been a lot of a through line here about taking the time to think, taking the time to ask. Um, they're both very uh, helpful things to do in a game. Yeah, the theme is keep calm and carry on. Um, <laughs> awesome. All right. Thank you so much, guys, for your tips and insights. Um, I know that I would have found those super helpful um, when I was learning. And um, I, yeah, I hope the people that are listening to too. Alrighty. We'll say goodbye. Thank you very much, everyone, for watching. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Good hunting, all.